there's a chance that there's going to be some background noise because the not my road but the the road that is like adjacent to my road is being repaved which is great hey la needs better roads uh just in general so just be be mindful of that i apologize i'll pre-apologize for that if i if if all of a sudden i mute my mic then it's because there's you're usually you're usually pretty good only the most like insane out of control noises tend to break through the you know the filters and the cleverness of uh of all of this so you'll be you'll oh. be fine i think you'll well, be all right just i hope so and on the other where's, hand where is my cat yes just my cat can be <laughs> anywhere within 30 feet of me and somehow knows precisely how to meow like a sonic weapon pointed directly yes. at my microphone which normally That's picks pretty... up no other outside noises you know except for oh. my cat because it's the microphone is just assuming that the cat is just like another variant of my own voice mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. smooth somehow the meow is at the same decibel level as your voice mm -hmm. yeah i mean these things happen these things happen um yeah no, i don't no. know why i can't <laughs> possibly imagine meow why <laughs> But. all right yeah yeah um silly little hamilton uh hey speaking of silly little hamiltons do we want to talk about our silly little hamilton our collective silly little it wasn't that silly it wasn't silly at all it was actually it was a very serious very serious hamilton. very very serious but yes yeah. let's talk about it yeah. right meow let's do it <laughs> Welcome to the F1 Files, folks. This is our Formula One podcast. It's just a couple of best friends who absolutely love and, F1. And a cat. And also and a, cat. a cat. And also a cat. Uh, we all love F1, even when F1 doesn't love us back. I'm one of the hosts. My name is Corey Willis. I'm a writer, actor, improviser out here in Los Angeles, California. And this is John Lepore, creative consultant designing the future for film technology and automotive, holding it down on the East Coast. Uh, all right, we've got a race weekend, which has just concluded mm -hmm. um, yes. our first sort of batch or our double header of back-to-back uh, -back races. And then we're mm -hmm. going to head into the rest of the season. We've got a week weekend off and then yep. into Australia, but... Uh, already starting to see some sort of storylines coming together for the season at large and also just, yeah. you know, a good sense of things that are happening both on track and off. Corey, where do you want to start? Well, let's start with the most boring part. No, just kidding. Let's not start with the most boring part. The most boring part was the Grand Prix itself, was the on-track action. <laughs> let's start with all that off-track action, all that good stuff, all oh, boy. the the trash that anyone oh. could ever want to wade through let's chat christian let's horner get into the, the, get into the, the biggest uh, let's get into the uh, let's get, get into the trash corner uh, uh, put on our biohazard uh, suits uh and, uh and just start to wade through the mess uh so Christian Horner update. Uh, it's it's they're coming. Let's, fast let's and try furious. and make this brisk too, because the longer we stay in this Horner garbage, the grosser the grosser I yeah. feel. Like speed yeah. round uh -huh. on Horner. Uh -huh. We've had uh, let's see, um, they've fired the victim Sus or, suspended. or suspended suspended Quote the unquote. victim. Um, mm -hmm. Not doesn't feel like the smoothest of moves. Nope. Um, we've had a uh, day before of... international women's day. They suspended yes. the complainant. <sighs> yes. Suspended really the complainant. Uh, you know, words are still zigzagging back and forth all over the place about, mm -hmm. uh, this divide within the Red Bull organization. It's becoming clearer and clearer that there's two factions within yeah. Red Bull corporate, not in Red Bull racing, but within yep. Red Bull corporate. And it almost makes it sound as though Red Bull Racing itself is like all against Horner to some extent. Like, I don't know, maybe yeah. maybe 
Checo is in Horner's court. I don't know who who knows. Um, I mean, but... Checo's there only because he wants to maintain his race seat, uh, which is just oh gross. yeah. I mean, che- yeah, it's it's yeah, yeah. it's che- Checo's got a lot to lose pretty much in yeah. any different way this thing unfolds. Yeah. Um, yep. We've got yeah more Yoss and uh, Yoss versus Horner. Yas uh-huh. aligned with Helmet Marco. Helmet Marco running his mouth as he's prone to do and openly talking about how he's about to be suspended, but yeah. that he's the one that gets to choose what happens, not anybody else in this scenario. And there's also a nasty <sighs> little rumor that Helmet Marco is the one who leaked the Google Drive, which makes perfect sup- sense. Sup- Yes, supposedly that's the reason for him to be suspended is that he's actively yeah. being investigated for perhaps being the one to have mm-hmm. leaked the Google Drive. Um, the grossest part of all of this that you you brought up hesitantly last week, I heard a mm-hmm. little more about, which was this thing that like the victim in all of this may have actually been romantically entangled with... Yas and what I had heard this past week was that maybe that actually predated what was yes. happening between Christian and this employee. So like layers of scumminess all spiraling out mm-hmm. of control. Um, we have things like, you know, all the speculation about, all right, well, if all this stuff goes a certain way, then helmet leaves. That means Max leaves. That means Everybody Adrian else leaves. That means they go? Yeah, Adrian leaves. leaves. That yeah. means yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. It's, it's, it's a it's a it's an avalanche from there. Um, yeah. We have Toto Wolf, who seems to just be happily rubbing his hands together and lapping up all of this chaos. What did what did he what did he chime in with, Corey? Yeah, he chimed in with one of the most uh, uh, offensive little jokes you could chime in with. Uh, which is he said that oh well if uh if helmet marco gets fired from red bull um you know we're missing our mascot we're missing our old man all we need to do is give him a red hat uh which basically means that toto was trying to say not even trying to say he was saying oh um uh, nicky lauda used to be our uh our old man uh, our old man at the team uh, who would pop off and say whatever he wanted and was kind of a lightning rod for attention. Why don't, why you know, Marco could be that person. Uh, and the, the reason why it's so insulting is because uh, Helmet Marco, um, he you can like, if you see pictures of him, you'll see that he has, uh, he at some point suffered a head injury, uh, which has made his eye uh, a little bit wandery or maybe dysfunctional or non-functioning or not functioning at a certain level. And that was his, a result of a, a race. Um, that was a result of, of, a, of an accident that happened, um, which I think is the reason he doesn't race anymore. But trying to compare him to Nikki Lauda, Nikki Lauda, who is like one of the most revered people in motorsport, one of the most accomplished people in motorsport, someone who came back from literally the jaws of death uh, and survived a fiery crash uh, to go on to build one of the greatest legacies in motorsport history. You, you're, you're calling him a mascot. And I just, I want to read uh, um, um, what the definition the Oxford Dictionary definition of a mascot Uh-oh. is, which is a person or thing that is supposed to bring good luck or that is used to symbolize a particular event or organization. Nikki Lauda was not a good luck charm. Okay, Toto? Nikki Lauda was not a good luck charm. That is so insulting to refer to him as a good luck charm, even if it is a joke, even if it is in jest to say oh we would love to have another old guy who's like a veteran of the old guard show up and be a member of our team and be a a a productive member of our driver development program like get out of here dude get out of here um also one of the reasons why toto is saying hey we need someone to take over our uh our driver uh development program is because 
D'Ambrosio, who was supposed to take over for Toto eventually when he retired, is now heading up the driver program at Mercedes. It has been announced that he is going to go to Ferrari and work with Ferrari now. So, oh, li- yeah. So, yeah. It, there, right. it's, so th- oh, to me, this it. is I just the it. beginning of a season's worth of, uh, you know, not very well thought out comments coming from a very desperate Toto Wolf. Um, yep. You know, I mean, that's the, I, I get it, you know, like, I mean, you know, I, I mean, it's, uh, uh it's pretty gross but i would probably also if i was in toto's position i would be like yes we'll set aside a a recliner in the garage Mm -hmm. for helmet marco sure we'll give him a a crazy old man chair and a you know megaphone that he can shout insane things into uh if that gets us max verstappen uh driving one of our cars um all right so beyond Beyond that nonsense, we descend into the race weekend. Um, yeah. Things were mostly quiet in terms of chaotic developments around this over the course of the race weekend, aside from the fact that like everyone is having microphones shoved in their faces and being asked yes. questions about this. Uh, did yeah. you have a chance to watch the team principal press conference, which it was like, like it was Horner's turn to appear in the mm-hmm. team principal's press conference. And like, I don't want to like rehash anything that came out there. It was just kind of enjoyable watching him squirm and also watching the other team principals all be like, I'm going to sit as far away from this guy that. on the bench as I yes. possibly can, like James Vowles, uh, you know, just being like, I'm just going to pretend that, you know, everything to my right does not exist. Uh, yeah. And it was, uh, yeah. Kinda, it's like kind of nice to see. And yeah. When, when you're like at like, uh, at like the movie theater, uh, and, um, and somebody like basically like spills their whole soda on the seat next to you. And you yep. like scoot over like that's what James Vowles looked like he was doing. He's like, ah, I can't reasonably scoot over anymore. So I'm just going to like unreasonably scoot myself yeah. uh, closer. I'm going to say not even a movie theater. It was like he was on the New York subway and there was a fluid yes. spill and he was yeah, doing his best seats, yeah. <laughs> to to sort of physically protect himself while also appearing yeah. emotionally unaffected by anything that was happening. Yes. Just how, you, how you analogy. operate in that yeah. in that context. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So we also saw uh, several drivers and other entities have microphones stuffed in their face, and I'm I'm honestly just sort of like kind of a, a appalled a little bit, or I wonder if there's just like yep. a problem in international motorsports or in international motorsports PR or something where. Nobody seemed prepared or nobody seemed at least remotely deft at handling mm-hmm. those questions and inquiries. Um, well, there was many one, of the one, drivers. One person, only one person. We, uh, we had, we Zach, had one driver and one. Well, we had, yeah. we had Zach Brown and we had uh, an elegant statement from Lewis Hamilton as well, which were um, very, thoughtful and well considered and just about like, you know, phrasing, you know, and, and framing this around like, Hey, the sport needs to be a comfortable and accepting place, especially in this modern era. And as we're trying to make the sport grow, you know, uh, it's not just a nice to have, it's everybody's responsibility to make sure that we don't have, uh, you know, things that are as horrifically uncomfortable as what has been unfolding in F1. And then you have a string of other personalities, uh, Lando Norris, Daniel Ricardo, like people who are fan favorites, people who are beloved figures. Alex Albon, who, Alex, like Alex one of Albon. the supposed people nicest people in the world. People you think of as being very like yeah, grounded and kind and thoughtful individuals who all somehow weren't instructed not to say things like, you know, describing this as a distraction or noise. Yeah. or noise and or distractions. Whatnot. Like, yeah. uh, I, I just want to focus on the racing. Like, it, it's this weird thing of like Zach Brown and Lewis Hamilton have this like much wider scope of this and being like, hey, 
this isn't just like a pockmark on this F1 season. This isn't just a problem that is like uh that that distracts us from what's happening on track. Like this is a systemic problem that needs to be addressed. We've been trying to address it, but there are some people, there are other entities uh in this sport that just do not take it as seriously. And uh Daniel Ricardo is is someone who uh I have like a newfound dislike for um because he did lit like he and Sergio and Alex Albon uh and quite frankly Lando Norris too just because he's like best friends with Max so he's like trying to stay out of it or whatever but also Lando Norris doesn't have the best track record for uh inclusivity when it comes to women uh so he's been dismissive yep. of women's plates before i've never seen alex albon do anything like this uh i kind of expected sergio perez to fall in line and support christian horner because he's trying to maintain his seat yep. and that's just gross um but also not surprising uh but daniel ricardo was a real like gut punch for i think most of the F1 fan base to hear his response was just like, Oh buddy. Like, even if you wanted to make light of this, like that calling it distract noise and distractions, like this is a person's life that has been destroyed. This is a bat signal to every other woman <laughs> in motorsport yeah. to say, Hey, guess it, what? You're they, not yeah. valued. Like, you don't get to call that noise and distractions without a ton of blowback, a ton of deserved blowback. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just so gross. I don't, yeah. So. I don't, I don't know. I don't know how that happened. I guess I'm not, I'm not that surprised that there's comments that are of the nature of like, we're just focused on the racing. Like I would have expected that, but uh, yes. to me again, like for these people that, have some pretty serious media training uh whoever yeah. whoever was doing the media training in the last week uh really missed the mark completely and it does make me wonder if like within the bubble of mm -hmm. f1 if there's a very 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 different approach to all of this yeah. that is that is going on which you know i've caught a little sense of that in some media outlets or in some places where they take the position of like, we're just going to try to ignore that this story is unfolding yeah. and whatnot, which uh, I think there's reasons for that to happen, but there's also areas where it's been like pretty roughly dismissed. And although I even feel gross that we have dedicated as much time to discussing this over the past few weeks yeah, as yeah. we have, uh, I'm pretty sure the, the only wrong thing to do is to pretend that it's not happening. Yeah. Yeah. It really, that really is. And it, it does suck, John. Like I don't want to be talking about this and, uh, and not just, I don't want to be talking about this. I don't want this to be something that has to be talked about. Like that's, yep. that's the right way of phrasing this, which is like, this shouldn't be a thing that we're discussing. It is 2024 for Christ's sake. They had the F1 Academy, launch this weekend and this is how yep. they handled this they, they yeah. they're literally trying to create a league that is adjacent to f1 that includes women and makes them feel representative like represented on the grid like in the paddock and then yeah. we have half the paddock basically dismissing uh sexual uh a sexual predation on a woman like it's just such a like yeah Oh, I would so gross. It's I, so gross. I would invite everyone to check out um Laura Winter. Uh yes. she tweeted this out, but during one of the broadcasts, she made a brief, very personal statement yeah. about this. And if you read her tweet, there's even more personal layers um supporting this. But you know, she just made a, a brief statement about like, hey, like, you know, and she's a she's a important figure in the sport in the paddock a recognized um you know broadcaster and, and mm -hmm. personality who herself had to effectively say like 
as a woman, it has yeah. not been very comfortable to be here in this sport while all of this is unfolding. So, yeah, again, like, I just I, I do during this d during her like tenure at F1, she had she was the victim of sexual assault or a victim of like assault because she was a woman. Like while she was a broadcaster at F1, oh, she's yeah. been dealing with this stuff. So like it's like it's not an old thing that like, oh, wow, the sport is now accepting of women yeah. and we just have to be aware of what used to happen. It's like, no, this stuff is literally still happening right now in between. Like, it's oh, it's just so gross. It's so gross. And I, I, I hate that it is a part that it is not just a part of our sport, but it feels like it's like a cornerstone of F1 is just awful misogyny. And like, I i hate that that's like it it's just a partner with the sport that i love like it's and i it, it it's gross and terrible it's one of the reasons i stopped watching the nfl was because of like their cavalier attitude towards sexual assault and battery and rape and like i was like oh, i can't i can't even watch this stuff and like i mean here, uh, it's uh, it's it's a weird thing but for to me i don't know like for I and I I'm not sure exactly why it is, but motorsports yeah. has always very clearly been like the single most toxic, like yeah. the single most like overflowing with you know toxic masculinity uh, of any major sport, you know more yeah. so than football or any yeah. any of the other big sports. Uh, motorsports yep. has always been the place where like being a kid and attending a motorsport event at like any level that my dad mm -hmm. would bring me to, like I would, I would see some, <laughs> you know, like I would yeah. see some things go down that I was like, Whoa, never seen that out in the outside <laughs> yeah. of, uh, you yeah. know, outside 19... of a gas station bathroom. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Outside yeah. of a gas station bathroom or mid nineties times square, you know? Like, yeah. It's, yeah. yeah, just some wild mm. objectifying happening, some wild stuff. Uh, and that is just a part of this sport. But that's the thing is that it can be a part of this sport as long as it's acknowledged that it is a part of the sport and not swept under the rug. And act yeah. like we can't act like this doesn't exist. Uh, so uh, there, there, F1 has a lot of work to do. Uh, it's doing some of the work but it feels like a lot of the work that's being done right now is lip service versus like the actual work that needs yeah. to be done. Um, Very much so. The, yeah. The implementation of all these things that they're saying versus just the like, yeah, we support women. Clearly you don't. Clearly you don't. Actions speak louder than words. So, all right. Oh God. I, I just, I want Horner to get what he deserves, which is just, he should, hopefully get fired this week that's the that's the other this is this is the conspiracy this is the rumor is that there are we, we can pivot out of the trash corner into the conspiracy closet uh, and talk about yes uh briefly talk about uh what's going it, on the the murmurs yeah. at the moment have built to the point that at some point before the australian grand prix in two weeks mm -hmm. yep it is expected that Christian Horner will finally be cut off from Red Bull. Thank God. I, Thank God. you know, which, which when that happens, will it'll be sad for many reasons. Um, it'll be mm -hmm. sad that after all of this, the thing that was like the most obvious <laughs> move to make right up front, uh, you know, happened, but only after layers and layers of a yeah. kind of just like, you know, a disaster that stains the team and the sport and and whatnot mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. there's that i'm also and and well this is weird i'm very happy to see christian horner swept away but i am also saddened that that means that probably all of the crazy fallout or shenanigans of max leaving the team and things like yes. that will almost definitely not unfold uh do you think yeah. there's any scenario where horner has been canned and max still leaves red bull is there any chance that this is sort of like wet his appetite or at least got him thinking enough about other things like it planted the seed in his mind and then he'll 
you know, he'll he'll still have that urge to to jump. I think the seed has been planted, but I believe that Max is entirely focused on performance and there yeah. are no other teams that can hold a candle uh to Red Bull right now. Even I mean Ferrari can, but Lewis Hamilton is going there at the end of this year and they've got Charles Leclerc. There's no room for Max at that team. Uh, And I think that if Mercedes had come out of the gate strong, or at least showed up this weekend as a a decent uh, force on track, then I think we still may have seen Max go somewhere else. But I think that that door uh, is all but like, dead bolted at this point because there is no pace at Mercedes. So, and that was kind of the idea was he was like, Oh, Hey, we might get uh, max moving to Mercedes. Um, yeah. What, what do you think, Johnny? Where, where are we at? Yeah. I think the, I think the seed has been planted and part of me hopes that there's, you know, to me, the move of max to Mercedes, like moving to an obviously inferior team, yeah. could potentially be this like ultimate ego move of like well if i could win there then i'm yeah. truly the greatest driver the sport has ever seen whereas I mean, that's, if this I is, keep this is schumacher at, stuff this is yeah. schumacher did this with ferrari he went to ferrari yep. and brought ferrari out of the mid pack and up to the top step of the podium for yep uh, like <laughs> to create a dynasty there so yeah I mean, so it's if possible. you know if he stays at Red Bull, the, it'll always still be a little bit of a question of like, well, was it just yeah. was it just the car? Was it exclusively yeah. just the car? I don't think yeah. anyone. I, I I I think everyone realizes he's tremendous talent combined yeah. with the best car on the grid. Um, but yeah, uh, I don't I don't think we're going to see him go go anywhere. No. I think you I no. think you don't you don't walk away from that. Adrian Newey sculpted car. No, you just no. you just can't. Not, you can, not you wise. Would, not smart. Yeah. Why why would you ever leave a competitive team to go to a less competitive team? I mean, just that all by itself, strip away everything else, strip away who we're even talking about, right? Like any competitor, any athlete is going to go like, no, I want to be on the best team with the best support. Why would I go to a team that, I am literally watching fall apart and like, like why, why would you ever do that? Uh, I mean, I, yeah, I wouldn't do that. Um, especially because there is, there's just no reason for him to go. Right. Like yeah. he's got a contract. It's not like his contract is up at the end of this year. So it's like, why would he leave if the one person who has caused all this like nonsense and strife and drama at the team. If that person goes, why would anyone else leave? I mean, I, I wouldn't, if I was max, uh, yep. I've never put myself in the position of being max for snapping before, but I'll say right now, first time ever, I would stick around with Red Bull. I would stick with Red Bull. If I was max, I hate that. I even said that. Cause that's <sighs> oh, God, he's, he's destroying everyone. Um, so we've got one last conspiracy. Yep. Before we yep. get out of the conspiracy closet, and this one just surfaced, uh, or at least an update on yes. a conspiracy cold case. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. Just just was updated in the last hour or so, which is there's, that there's a folder out. that's sitting on top of a filing cabinet, and that folder has dust all over it, and like uh like a fan turned on and like blew some dust off of it. And we're like, Oh wow. There's something on top of that filing cabinet. And yes, there is. Yes, there is. Felipe, Felipe Massa has now officially suing the FIA formula Uh, one and Bernie Ecclestone, which is actually uh kind of ironic in a way uh, over the results of the 2008 world championship where Felipe Massa narrowly lost yes. the championship and and you'll always remember always have burnt into your memory the image of uh him briefly being the championship winner 
yes. as he crossed the finish line first in the the yeah. race in Brazil, in his home country of Brazil. Yeah. And where yeah. his father and brother are jumping up and down, celebrating with the mechanics before another mechanic comes over and tells them, sorry, guys, uh, after he passed the finish line, Lewis Hamilton moved up a position, which gave him just enough points to take. Yeah his first championship instead of Felipe's. Yep. Um, yep. This oh. is not about that moment, but is a lawsuit based on the fact that at the Singapore Grand Prix, the Renault team did mm -hmm. some shenanigans. It was found out that they intentionally had a car crash to bring out a yellow flag to yep. uh, get Alonzo uh, further up the ranks in, in that race. Um, really messy, really ugly stuff that that was. But if those points were effectively canceled out, or if there was a stronger penalty against Renault for that incident, yeah. that, uh, Felipe Massa would have had enough points to win the world championship. Um, yeah. ooh, this was murmured of happening months back. And I believe it was Bernie Ecclestone himself who was dumping who kerosene like, onto the flames. Yes. Just fully yeah, being was, like, Felipe, go sue them. You, you are entitled to this. Yeah. Like he, uh, he made some statement along the lines of like, well, if I was Felipe, I would, yeah, I would be I would, suing because of that championship that I lost in Felipe, who had finally found peace in his life, who finally was, you know, yeah, you know, in a, I don't know, a Brazilian vineyard or, or something, uh, you know, relaxing and enjoying uh, himself. This yeah. message comes out from Bernie Ecclestone and Felipe just like starts twitching, you know, like he yeah. just starts like getting <sighs> super tense. And uh, yeah. And now uh, now he's probably got a few years of heartache and drama ahead of him. That and isn't again, going to ever sufficiently change things in the way that you would want them changed. Exactly. And the peop if if you're a, a, a not even a, a long standing fan of F1, but if you've been watching F1 over the past five years, you have noticed that last year Felipe Massa was not sporting an F1 polo going up and down the pit lane interviewing people like he's losing opportunities. He's losing contact with the sport that he loves because of this. And like. It I just it breaks my heart to see this go forward because I think that maybe if this hadn't gone forward, we would have seen Felipe maybe at like uh Monza, maybe we would have seen him in Sao Paulo, maybe we would have seen him at Monaco in the pit lane. Yeah. But there's no way we're gonna see him representing F one if he's suing F one right now. It's just not it, yeah. It really it, it's it's heartbreaking and really tricky because he is such a beloved character and such a beloved driver and such a wonderful personality uh, and someone who's like fun to kind of like rib and kind of poke fun at and stuff, too. Like he's just such a, a, a wonderful entity. And it just it's heartbreaking that he is basically excommunicating himself from F1 with this. And yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm sure that Nelson PK has been putting a bug in his ear this whole time, too, um, because that was PK Jr. who was driving for Renault yeah. when that happened. So it's like it's just tangled up in like the grossest possible way. And I mean, oh. if this moves, if this moves forward in any sort of productive manner, then it immediately, the very next thing that happens is, okay, well, when do we bring Abu Dhabi 21 to court yeah. and, yeah. and whatnot and, and all of these things. And it's just, it's just such a ugly precedent. I feel for the, for the sport uh, saddens me. Felipe seems like a lovely gentleman and yeah. I just wish him, I just wish him like a, a lovely post formula one life you know yeah and i feel like this is just going to be heartache and pain for uh for for him in a way that i don't think he deserves but has somehow no. been compelled or that you know that itch has yeah. to be scratched now so yeah I, he won't let it go he will not let it go um hey maybe he'll have a future at like i know that there's like a 
um uh a blossoming like nascar league basically not nascar but it's like brazilian nascar uh is Mm -hmm. basically like taking off so maybe he'll have a place in that um uh similar to like uh uh juan pablo montoya leaving f1 and going and like absolutely crushing it in nascar here in the states maybe maybe felipe will get involved um down there um it's it's pretty sad but hey you know what's not sad is all the promos that we've seen for the Kidya uh, racetrack. Um, all, all those adverts, all those like sneaky little so, ads that weren't ads. <laughs> okay, so there's uh, this was midway through last week. There uh-huh. was videos posted to social media. And I would say as far as these things go, as far as like a uh a kind of vision film you know like a slickly yeah. produced visual effects vision of this not even just like formula one track but this i guess like city or Basically. entertainment center that is being built in the in the middle east um yeah really spectacular looking the i believe there's they're saying targeting 2028 was that it yes Um, yes it should be finished in 2027 and in like in preparation for the 2028 season supposedly so this is to me like i'm not exactly pining for another uh middle eastern f1 race we currently have four on the calendar um yeah because we don't have qatar on there right now so it's only four but there are five places that we can race in the middle east it's aggressive and and this now potentially being a six um it looks insane it looks yeah. absolutely looks wild. so cool. It's yeah. It looks like the next evolution of like you know Abu Dhabi, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, Abu Dhabi already being a very you know I would describe it as a futuristic in appearance location for an F one race. Um, yeah. Yeah. With as someone who's doubt, been to Abu Dhabi and been to the circuit, yeah. like it does feel like insane that that place does exist where it exists like it uh, it's like all of a sudden you're like oh oh we're in like a city that is adjacent to abu dhabi that is basically dedicated to motorsport it's pretty cool so i mean this immediately appears to be a spare no expense like you know las vegas on steroids um you know anything you could imagine is possible with you know fabricating Mm -hmm. effectively a city and a racetrack and even though the terrain maybe wouldn't be as dramatic for creating an exciting racetrack uh don't worry about that because we can artificially generate that in any way that you want leading to probably the craziest feature of this track Corey. what what is it it is the seven story. I think it's seven stories. Uh, 20 stories. Sorry, 20 a hun- stories. 108 meters. That's 300 bananas. plus feet. That's bananas. It's like the turn what like the, it's like like turn one at Coda uh, at the Circuit mm-hmm. of the Americas in Austin. Uh, you've been there. I haven't been there, but like I, you can see how dramatic the the turn one at coda is unbelievably steep yeah um unbelievably steep hill right after the start that has effectively a hairpin corner at the top of this hill and comes right back down which makes it look like almost like a roller coaster track in and of itself and this is effectively the same thing except i believe steeper and Taller. Yeah, like almost twice the height and steepness of turn one at Coda. Uh, it is, Crazy. it it looks so cool, and uh, and I do believe that the Saudis will be able to pull this off. Um, they helped uh, the people in the Emirates create literal islands uh, in in the sea. So like, there is definitely 
the engineering uh, prowess uh, of the Saudis is very much uh, going to be on display here. And like, I think that this has the potential to be one of the coolest looking tracks, one of the most entertaining tracks to not just like watch, but all the drivers. And this kind of gets into like the, the weird squishy part of it. Um, like the drivers seem pretty pumped on it too. Uh, but a lot of the drivers basically put out almost identical posts. Yeah, almost identical <laughs> hashtag laden posts. Yeah. So from and so from Fernando Alonso, the guy who you know yeah. usually doesn't BS about anything. That was the first post I on saw. His too. official, yeah. yeah, on his yeah. official Twitter account, it is. The proposed new circuit at Cadilla City looks to be one of the most impressive facilities for motorsports worldwide, with high-speed thrills, incredible elevation, immersive attractions, and experiences that'll excite the fans like never before. I mean, spoken exactly as you would expect, directly from the mouth of Fernando Alonso, not some sort of Saudi PR, GPT formation. No of, way, no of way, any no kind way. um <laughs> yeah so several drivers unleashing statements like that to me it's just a it's it's not so much that they are endorsing it it's that i'm all the more confident that this will be built because they're spending absurd yes. amounts of money to get the drivers to make simple statements like this yeah yeah. And and spending the money without like, the like without the detailed thought about like, will this perhaps come across as slightly ingenuine? No, no, no. This fits in directly no. with everything else that comes out of Fernando's mouth. Um, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. uh that's and that's even technically I guess I guess against the like Twitter, you know, terms of service, like when you do something yeah. like that, you are supposed to uh, be clear that it's an advertisement, but whatever. It, it's by all, literally just all putting part the, of the. If you put the hashtag ad, hashtag ad, yep. that's all you need to do in order to like clear whatever uh, protocols Twitter uh, or Instagram have. And like none of the drivers did that. Like they were just like, eh, whatever. Um, which I feel like is also calculated because hey, maybe these platforms will remove those posts and then the drivers will have been paid to make the post and then the post won't appear in their feed anymore. So maybe it's like, maybe there's some like extra bit of uh, tomfoolery happening here. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm really excited to see that track. And it looks like Nico Hulkenberg uh, was like one of the people who was there at like the groundbreaking ceremony. So it was like Nico Hulkenberg, I think Roman Grosjean was there too, because this isn't just an F1 track. This is like for motorsports yeah. uh, in general, they will have multiple events over the course of the year here. Um, but like it was him. And I think maybe Stefano might've been in that picture too, but there was like, just basically like the rock outcropping, that is now synonymous with uh, the Kidia uh, racetrack. It's that like really cool looking, uh, just like angular rock formation. They're all standing in front of it, um, like nothing built, just desert behind them. So they were there when they basically started this. So I do trust Nico Hulkenberg um, that he is like really, truly enthused about this. But, you know, um, the Saudis have a lot of money to throw around at drivers and at athletes. And I wouldn't be surprised if they just threw a ton of money at every single driver just to be like, hey, promote this. Or when someone puts a microphone in front of your face to ask you about it, say nice things, say encouraging yep. things, um, which I don't fault. I do not fault the Saudis for that. Uh, it's a little weirdly like underhanded and a weirdly like we're just going to do what we want. But also I'm like, oh, okay, go ahead and do what you want. You made Jetta, Jetta, despite oof, despite this Grand Prix, uh, Jetta is a wildly entertaining track uh, to watch yep. cars on, um, and it would be a track that I would like to go to uh, eventually, because uh, the idea is they will have two tracks in Saudi. They will have Kidia and they'll have Jetta, and they will both operate yep. on the F1 calendar. Maybe not at the same year, but they will be uh available from year to year and maybe there will be some uh alternates which stefano talked about as well 
with the European Grand Prix. He's like, hey, we're going to start rotating Grand Prix. The calendar's too full, um, yep. which I think is smart instead of going like, hey, let's like just like race three quarters of the year. It's like, well, no, <laughs> let's, let's, let's do <laughs> let's do additional race weekends between the race weekends on Tuesday, Wednesdays and Thursdays. Yeah, Why not? yeah that's no problem. Oh, we get Monday off still. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. Johnny. Let's get into the race weekend. What, there was a race this weekend? (laughs) Was there actually racing this weekend? The sport of Formula One? Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Uh, There was a a Grand Prix. Uh, Not as exciting, even as Bahrain, which also was not very exciting. Yeah, strangely enough, less exciting than the first race of the season. Um, All right, so, I mean... Not a lot to pick apart here, but there's definitely one huge story yes. to the race. What what was that? Uh, that would be Ali Berman, Oliver Berman, the uh, the development driver for Ferrari. He was at Abu Dhabi last year and put in some incredible times during a practice session. Uh, Carlos Sainz, unfortunately, uh, came down with appendicitis uh, on. I mean, he was he had it Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, yeah. uh, and was literally racing in practice sessions. Was, One was two. just not feeling good um, yeah, during yeah. the race weekend, and yeah, it turned out that you know he needed to have some uh, little little surgery done. Needed to uh, you know yeah. have a piece piece of his insides completely removed. Yep. Um, before he can uh, get back out there. Yeah. Well. Well. I mean, just imagine. Uh, not even imagine you, you just because you, you can't imagine just the G force is going through someone's body and like now oh imagine God. one of those parts of your body is like trying to explode uh, while like those forces are being put through it. It's just like, wow, I can't imagine the pain that that dude was in while trying to drive an F1 car. Uh, so he dips out, goes and gets his appendix out, uh, and makes it back to the track, um, by the time the Grand Prix starts. Uh, however, he could not race. So we had Oliver Behrman in this. Now, how did, how did Ollie do this weekend, John? So Ollie, uh, jumped into qualifying Yep. Uh, so he joined practice three, right? Free practice three, which again is an unrepresentative practice session because yeah. it's during the day versus free practice two, which would have been good for him to be at because he would have seen the conditions of the race. But So whew. he was expecting to be racing F2. He qualified on Basic- pole uh, for the F2 race. Yeah. Yep. Yep. He... Instead of driving that car, which he knows incredibly well, gets yeah. into a Formula One car for effectively the first time ever because he's like the only person in the vicinity that they can swap into the seat really, really yeah. quickly with yeah. some the level of confidence. Who has had a seat fit, who has been fitted yeah. for the seat itself. Um, yeah, the seats are removable in F1. Uh, they literally remove the seat for the the seat there's no choice but for the seat to be perfectly sculpted to your specific body and to try to you know operate one of these vehicles in someone else's seat would be painful if not just impossible um ollie jumps into the car and this is a car that is going around the same exact track he knows the track well because he's already qualified there he's got the track down but he's for the first time ever going around this track like something like 30 or 40% faster yeah. than he ever has before. Yeah. It was uh 14 seconds uh was the difference between the lap times that he was putting in. His pole laps and his free practice laps were like yeah. 14 seconds apart. 14 seconds faster going around uh, what is it like a 6 mile track like that's Whew, that's I mean bad. that's that's crazy. That's yeah. like that alone is that's just like a very very different experience. Every single thing yeah. that you know about 
where you're hitting the brakes, where you're turning the wheel, all of that, like, uh, mm -hmm. it, it's a, just a very different feeling altogether. So he damn near makes it to qualifying three. Yeah. He does not, he doesn't, he doesn't set himself up to qualify last. Yep. He doesn't qualify somewhere in the middle back of the pack. He straight up qualifies 11th for the race, which yeah. that alone is a miracle for, you know, jumping into an unfamiliar vehicle and and navigating it if, around. If he had had all three practices, that still would have been an incredible feat. Okay. If he had been in all three practice sessions, it would still be like, oh, wow, you almost made the top 10 and qualify. I mean, there are people in F1, I mean, Yuki Sonoda, uh, uh, specifically, who like his entire goal for this whole year was to start making it to that third qualifying session. Oliver Behrman yep. spends one hour, one hour in that Ferrari and then hops into a qualifying session and almost out qualifies Lewis Hamilton. He literally was 34 hundredths of a second behind Lewis yeah. Hamilton. Like, that is bananas. That is, uh, there's. I, Absolutely I, I, insane. Oh, God. It really is. It really is. And he's 18, by he, the way. He's an 18-year-old. Yeah, he's 18. He's the third, he's third youngest, third youngest driver ever behind the wheel of one of these yep. cars. And on yep. race day. He crushes it. He ends up yep. finishing seventh. Yeah. Which means that he's passing deeply experienced drivers in a car that he still hasn't even had time to like, you know, figure out what all the buttons on the steering wheel are doing. Li like literally. Yeah. And not only that, but he's doing it while these other drivers are like antagonizing the shit out of him. Like yeah. everyone is yeah. beating on him hard. Was it Kevin Magnuson in the pit lane who did the like, oh, we're coming out of the pits at the same time. I'm just going to like drive alongside yep. you and try to like push you off to the side in the pit lane. And he held his own. Yeah. And he looked yep. for every single space that he could to get around another driver. And he did it. And he, he was attempting. It. He attempted to pass Yuki Sonoda on the first lap. Like on yeah. the first lap of the race, Yuki got ahead of him and he was like, uh uh, and then tried to get him again on a part of the track that usually passes don't even happen at um, uh, on the first lap because like the cars aren't close enough, but he still ended up trying to like pass Yuki. Um, yeah, and he like apologized because he wasn't getting past Kevin Magnuson. Like he's like, uh, I feel bad because I didn't like get past like, I, or it was maybe Nico, maybe it was Nico Hulkenberg, where he's like, Nico's so slow. He's he's his he's so slow. Why can't I pass him? And it's like, well, buddy, you're just take it easy. You just bring bring the car home. It was like Fred Vasor. First of all, they were like, hey, Fred, uh, wh when did you when did you reach out to Ollie? And he was like, uh, I reached out to him at two p.m. So he. Reached out yep. to him at 2 p.m. on Friday. And then Ollie had to get it, like, literally run back to him, like, run back to his comfort uh, trailer and, like, get his other clothes and his other uh, stuff for F1 instead of F2. Like, he was on yeah. his way to the F2 paddock. And Fred was like, hey, uh, we, we, need you in, we need you in the car, like, like in an hour. Can you be... Can you be ready in an hour? <laughs> Just truly impressive. Truly, truly impressive. Um, and so coming in seventh, he mm -hmm. bags six points yep. for Ferrari. And right now for the season as a whole, for yep. which he has, you know, only been pinch hitting for a single race, he's actually ranking 10th in the yes. overall driver standings two races into the season again Just the, those directly points directly behind him, yeah and yeah, he's directly, directly behind, behind lewis, lewis hamilton. hamilton yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's Ugh. just ah oh god it's so nuts it's so nuts 
really, really impressive work by by Behrman. Uh, this is one of those where, like, even after the race was over, uh, he ended up going like he he goes he goes on to like the the post race show, uh, and he's like, "Well, I just hope that I did enough to like, you know." impress people like i feel like i didn't do and everyone was like ollie but dude you're 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 good you're good you will at the very least be in a a seat next year um if not like you will be the person who replaces lewis hamilton when he ends up retiring from ferrari like that is almost certainly going to happen now after this past weekend so just i mean just incredibly a, strong performance yeah 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 there's there's nothing to compare this to there's no one you can really compare this weekend's performance to um because there are other people who have done something like this but they've had the full practice session to be like to kind of bed themselves in right or they've been racing for a while yeah or they've like, yeah or they've been in and out of other seats or partaken yeah. in a lot of testing of these cars and whatnot and this guy came in stone cold first time yeah. ever you know behind the wheel of this car and it's beautiful beautiful work uh so love the, love the to other, see it and the yeah. other young people the other young people who you're talking about who you referred to it's only happened to a couple other people the two other yeah. people are Sebastian Vettel and Max Verstappen. Those are the other two people who were very young who got into F1 seats and performed fairly well. Fairly well. Uh, The the only reason he will not beat Max Verstappen's record is because they changed the rules after Max Verstappen made it into F1. (laughs) So, like, Mm -hmm. otherwise I could see Oliver Behrman in an F1 car already, like, uh, at least a full season. So, uh, yeah, really, really impressive work. And I'm trying to remember the last time that I remember this happening at Ferrari was when um, Felipe Massa got injured, uh, got hit in the face with a spring and basically had to sit out the rest of the season. And Ferrari brought in, uh, I think it's Luca Badoer, who... Uh, mm-hmm. finished out the 2009 season for yeah. Ferrari. And he effectively was like finishing last for most yeah. of that season yeah. because he was just not, you know, although he was a former F1 driver himself, he just wasn't like in tune, hadn't been doing the races, you know, the the rest of the season and, yeah. and everything. And in, yeah. you know, filling in that space, just, you know, he, he was basically just keeping the car warm. And yep. so to see this kid getting middle of the pack, first time out. Yeah. Remarkable. Can't say, can't say enough about it. Um, yeah. Very, yeah. very, very cool stuff. And a- um, apparently Lewis had to like, people were like, oh, it's so cool that like Lewis yeah. waited for him a- a- after the race and like congratulated him and George went over and congratulated him. And uh, Oliver made a statement. I think it was like late last night or early this morning where he was like, um, actually, Lewis was helping me out of my car. I couldn't, I couldn't get out of the yeah. car. So Lewis physically helped me out of the car uh, before congratulating me. <laughs> it's like, all oh, right. Yeah, that's right. Cause... Yeah, you can see the head pads that are on either side of the helmet. I mean, these drivers, yeah. you know, we, we talk about it uh, uh, pretty regularly, but the drivers all must have a, a viciously strong neck in yes. order to handle the G-forces that are basically making it feel like uh, your your heavy helmeted head is trying to be ripped off of your shoulders. Yep. And uh, Ollie's, uh, I think it's his left uh, pad was uh-huh. almost completely collapsed. Like it is just like yeah. caved in completely from him probably just having to rely on that as a place for his head to rest after I'm sure midway through the race, his neck completely gave out on him just losing it yeah yeah oh god so so brutal so brutal um so we've mentioned lewis uh we've mentioned george um did you hear any of uh of what toto had to say uh about the mercedes no what 
what uh oh oh, oh yeah. yeah yeah i heard a little bit about this uh yeah so my understanding is that toto's uh, I, I don't know how to describe this. Is this a confession? Is this like a please don't blame me? Uh, yeah. Effectively, okay. it sounds like their simulation setup that they use yeah. to calculate and basically like pre-validate all of their engineering decisions. It sounds like there's it's just not working, right? It's defective or something. Yeah, just it's, it, yeah. There's it's a ghost yeah. in the machine. There, uh, yeah. Yeah, they, there was oh. a, a a a really a heartbreaking moment, um, but like such a perfect moment for the F one, uh, the directors, uh, the the people who direct the feed, the broadcast director. So there is a moment where Lewis is trying to catch Lando Norris uh, uh, towards the end of the race, oh, and yeah. he like is in the first sector and that was like the problem that lewis was having was in the first sector the high speed corners in the first sector and like lando norris basically like disappears up the road after being just like maybe eight car lengths ahead of him like all of a sudden he's just like nowhere to be seen um and it's Mm -hmm. after like two corners and the broadcast director cuts to a close up of Mick Schumacher in the Mercedes yeah. garage just like you see him like doing everything he can cuz he knows the camera's on him doing everything he can to just like stern faced look straight ahead and like during that moment when like that sector time pops up he like involuntarily just starts to like shake his head like oh no oh no oh no uh and like it was like oh yeah 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 Mick you got a lot of work to do, but you are basically going to be handcuffed to the simulator for the next week because there's a clear problem here. Uh, yeah. And that that's what, that's what Toto admitted to. He's like, yeah, so we have like a fundamental issue with our car this year again. There's another, yet another fundamental issue yeah. with the Mercedes. Uh, and... Yeah, I mean, Lewis in, like, the post-race interview was just so just, like, defeated. It was just like, I don't know. I don't know what's going on. There's clearly something wrong. There's clearly something that's, like, not right with our car right now. Uh, and then, yeah, Toto backed that up with being like, yeah, there's something wrong with the car. In fact, we think there's something wrong with the software on the simulator, and it's, like, telling us the wrong thing again. Which, folks... The reason we're saying again is because when these ground effect cars came out, Toto was like, the simulator numbers uh, are ridiculous. We're going to have like a second and a half on every other car. <laughs> and then <laughs> when it showed up the track, it was like, uh-oh, there's correlation issues. So, again, correlation issues. Sorry, right, though. At least they know what to do in this scenario because they've been in this scenario for now the past three years Uh, yeah yeah um so a bit disappointing there um some of the other feet so uh, overall the grand prix was excessively boring just an excessively boring grand prix the only fun parts were when oliver was making his way through the field uh and then another very entertaining part was when lewis was holding off oscar piastri but otherwise yep kind of blah not really interesting at all um yeah i mean so uh one other one other little thing that you know i noticed a lot of you know noticed during the race and then noticed a lot of people sharing a similar sentiment is it does seem like yep the formula one community are collectively cooling on danny rick yes um yeah, it's kind of uh, kind of kind of sad. We've all, I think, had a lot of love for this guy. And this this race seemed to cement like, OK, maybe maybe Danny Rick's Formula One era is kind of over. He just seemed to not be anywhere near where he wanted to be. He yeah. spun on the track entirely by himself at one point. Um, 
it oh, just it was even feels... more perfect than that, John. Uh, well, first of all, I want to give like a tiny bit of leeway to Danny Rick because there was a 41 second long pit stop that he was victim mm-hmm. of. Uh, it wasn't shown in the broadcast feed, but it was yep. revealed that it, there was a problem with, I think, his left rear left tire or something like that. Um, and basically, he spent 41 seconds in the pit lane, which sucks for sure. So it put him back in the field, but he was already back in the field. He was already way behind Yuki Tsunoda. Um, he had like a not a good start. He had a terrible first stint uh, and then an even worse second stint. Uh, and then when he spins on the track, John, do you know who was directly behind him when he spun on the track? Who was it? That would be one Sergio Perez who was about to lap him, oh. and he literally spun in front of Sergio Perez. Oh. Like, buddy, oh, man. buddy, that is the seat that you're trying to take next year, and you spun while getting lapped by him. Yeah. I mean, it, I think it's certainly feeling like he's not headed towards the Red Bull senior seat. No. Maybe even Yuki isn't headed towards the senior Red Bull seat. I think. Yeah, uh, I, think, I think I think that's going to be its own point of conversation. Who's yeah. who's going to end up next to Max next For season? Sure. But I think right now, Sergio Perez is fine. Sergio finished six seconds behind his teammate this race like he closed the gap up he had a very good race he had a decent qualifying he had a great first lap right like he got beaten by Charles off the line Charles is faster over the course of one lap the ferrari is a faster car over the course of one lap the red bull takes a while to heat up its tires but he still fought with uh, leclerc on the first lap and then ended up closing up the gap and was i mean I, i'm sure that max was kind of turning it down a little bit towards the end of the race but he literally shrunk that gap to six seconds where it was 12 last week or, or or 20 last week, almost like it was it's, he did a much better job this week than he did last week. And Ricardo did a much worse job. Yuki did a eh, job. Um, But also a lot of the sentiment online, John is Liam Lawson should be getting that seat next year. And maybe he should have gotten it this year. Like, that's what people are saying. They're like, why did we bring back Danny Rick? Just keep him as a third driver with Red Bull and give Liam Lawson that seat. Like, Well, I mean, we know how Red Bull operates. Maybe we don't have to wait until next season to see some musical chairs over there. Especially, Uh, especially if we lose one Christian Horner from the Red Bull uh, uh, camp because that is basically why Danny Rick still has a place in F1 is because he is Christian Horner's golden boy. Um, And like, what a, what a horrible star to have to hitch your wagon to. Uh, But, you know, um, based on his comments in the media, like, uh, sounds like you guys are kind of perfect for each other. Sounds like you're totally okay with forgiving Christian Horner's awful behavior as long as it guarantees you a place in F1. And if that's what you're going to do, then I'm happy to watch you spin out when you're in 17th place while getting lapped by the person you're trying to replace. It's kind of great. Kind of poetic. Lordy. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, all right, Johnny. Anything else from this past weekend or this week that has really stuck out to you? Uh, no, nothing else that's on my radar. Uh, you know, it's just another moment of me kind of like reassessing the sport that isn't loving us back all that much right now. And to me, I think this is, you know, the, the formula one stock is headed into a, a cold, Yes. slumpy part yes. of the season right now. And I'm really curious to see what it's going to take to sort of shake that up and, and yeah. wake things up a little more. Um, Cause the season I think is going to need a little, little rejuvenation or something uh, yeah. over the next, you know, if we have two more races in a row that go exactly like this, which they very well may. They probably will. 
it probably will, right? Yeah, I think it's going to be almost like emergency levels of like, okay, how do we, how do we turn yeah. this sport around a little bit? We got to fix this. Yeah, yeah. I think the stock has taken a pretty serious dip, uh, and it will. I think it's on that kind of like slow cooling trajectory as well, um, uh, especially because I don't think the Horner stuff is enough to sustain. Uh, people's interest in well it's also it's transitioning from being exciting gossip to just being like oh this was a sad trajectory that this took just shining a ton of negative light and negative energy towards the sport as a whole if it's truly going to end in the way that it sounds at the moment like it will with just like cool that could have happened before the season even started and we would have not had it all, you know, wouldn't have yep. had that dark cloud hovering over an already depressing race season. Yeah. Great. Well <laughs> yeah, done, cool. everybody. Bravo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. It's it's a little bit depressing. But hey, uh over the next couple of weeks we're going to get some time off. Hopefully there will be some more news that pops up um with with the potential um of Ali Behrman, right? Um, and yep. let's see if we can we can get uh, some of these uh, dum dums who made all these horrible statements over the past week. Maybe we can get an apology tour going over the next week and a half, uh, so that they can rectify uh, their so some of the, their statuses in uh, in F one. All right. Well, Johnny, where can the folks find you out there in the world? <sighs> Oh, you can track me down via my home base of johnnymotion.com where you can see me wallowing in, in my uh, trash corner Yes, any yes. anytime you want. Corey, where can the folks find you? Uh, they can track me down in the conspiracy closet. I am Corey P. Willis dot com check me out there uh you can also do some burn cory burn action on uh, social media. We're also the F1 files on all the social media stuff. Ah, well, folks, we're going to catch up with you next week, and you better catch up with us next week. That's right. I'm now threatening you. <laughs> um, the F1 Files. <laughs>